Hi everyone and welcome to Playtime Online. This is the Institute of Play's webinar series that allows us to connect and share our work with you. My name is Nancy Novacek. Today we'll be looking at participatory culture as a context and framework for situating games and art projects. We hope to see how these fields inform one another and what can be learned from working with games, working with games and the public in an institutional context. If at any point you'd like to ask today's speakers a question, just click on the blue participate text under this video on the right hand side. We'll be spending the last few minutes or so of the webinar answering questions to our, during our Q&A portion. Today's participants in uh, today's playtime are Ted Pervez. Ted Pervez is a writer and artist based in Oakland, California. His public projects and writings are centered on investigating the practice of art in the world. He was founder of the MFA Concentration in Social Practice at California College of Arts in 2005 and is currently the chair of the MFA Fine Arts Program. Ted and Shane Aslan Selzer are co-authors of What We Want is Free, Critical Exchanges in Recent Art in, that will be published by SUNY Press in early 2014. Our next participant, Shane Aslan Selzer, is an artist whose practice develops micro-communities where artists can expand on larger social issues such as generosity, exchange, and failure. Shital Prajapati is an associate educator in the public programs at the Museum of Modern Art. Last year, she organized a two-day conference exploring how artists are employing games as a framework for engagement, inspiration, and social change in their work. Since then, Shital has been working to develop other kinds of participatory experiences through long-term artist collaborations at MoMA. Pedro Reyes is a Mexican artist. He uses sculpture, architecture, video, performance, and participation. His work aims to increase individual or collective agency in social, environmental, and educational situations. Last but not least, Eric Zimmerman is a 20-year veteran of the game industry who creates games on and off the computer. Some of his recent game installations have been shown at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, in Berlin, Paris, and Dublin. Eric is also a professor at the NYU Game Center. Today's conversation is an exploration of the tiny tip of a very large iceberg. The correspondence between participatory art practice and games is something Ted and Shane and I have been talking about for the past several months. We've each been involved in public engagement in differing ways and have each noted more and more moments of crossover between our own work, the work of our other colleagues in the field, and games. We've also been noticing, alongside other forms of participatory project, an increasing amount of games appearing in cultural institutions, such as museums. It's far too large to fully explore in this hour of playtime, nor is this a topic from which succinct outcomes can be drawn just yet. We're excited to start thinking about these ideas, though, and to be joined by Eric, Pedro, and Schiedel. I was hoping, uh, Ted, you could start us out by giving some context for this conversation. Sure. Thanks, Nancy. So we're here, inhabiting a world of creative cultural production, which, oh, which includes things called art and things called games. From one perspective, there's a large area of overlap. Both of these things, after all, have creators or authors or designers. Both have complex histories that involve philosophy, aesthetics, social investigation. Both forms critically explore the potentials of narrative. Both can explore conceptual ideas of ontology. And both of these forms use and utilize aesthetic design strategies which bring people or audiences into relationship with the artwork or game. These are the creative and authorial contexts that lead game designers and artists to strive in similar directions. Coincident with this, there's also been a rise in institutional support, both from the art world and through the growing critical study of games, to create more experimental and hybrid platforms for these two forms to be seen in an increasingly interrelated way. However, from another perspective, games and artworks are fundamentally different and produce different effects within the world. This is not seen within the context of their creation and their design, but more is evident in the patterns of their use. Simply put, audiences for games and art not only use them differently, but they structurally inhabit or own them differently. Games have players. People who frequently, dedicatedly, and or seriously play games become, or perhaps already are, or always were, gamers. Gamers, in many cases, especially more so with the internet and sort of the advent of fan cultures, are able to have impactful relationships on the world of games without becoming professionals within the world of game production. On the other hand, art has viewers. 
And while people who are seriously involved in viewing art can, in certain circumstances, become more deeply involved in the world of art production, most of these roots of involvement are ultimately professional, i.e. they can start to work within the institutional art world, or they can go to get an MFA or a BFA in art and learn and perhaps try to become a professional artist themselves. These stakes might also, or roots of involvement, might also be financial. They can become art collectors and own artworks. But unlike gamers, there are no arters, someone, a fan or enthusiast perhaps, who uses art in an active or participatory way. Now just because there's no such thing as an arter does not mean that there's no real interest in discovering that such a person or role might exist. One of the most notable trends within the institutional art world, its museums and biennials for example, is a steady increase in programming art projects and artist-led events that attempt to more wholly and dynamically involve art viewers to bring them into the frame, so to speak. This is more complex and complete than earlier attempts to dissolve viewers and audiences through things like the elimination of the fourth wall in theater, which so simply sought to transform the passive spectator into an active viewer. So one of the key words in this trend has become the word participation and participant, a word which describes an interesting subcategory of audience a semi-empowered viewer, one who has the power to decide to participate and who actively supplies specific content to a project. Even if ultimately they only fulfill a subscribed role within the work itself, there is a degree of agency within the role of participant. The dynamics and politics of participation then have become quite important ones within the art world. I believe that, is this, that it is this interest in participation that is one of the forces that's leading institutional art world to more seriously consider games as both viable artworks in and of themselves, but also as strategic forms for both modeling and generating participation. The dynamics of this interest are probably too broad for full consideration within one hour panel, as Nancy's already intimated. There's just a great deal too much to say about it. Just this morning I read a particularly interesting piece by the game designer and conceptual artist Zach Gage which explored the aversion to considering play as an aesthetic term that might have similar gravity such as would be found in a term like beauty or criticality or narrative. Before we move on to the panel I wanted to add from my own perspective both as a writer who thinks about the economy of participation within the art world as well as that of a long-term gamer with over 40 years of life experience playing everything from chess to Dungeons and Dragons to Warhammer to Carcassonne, that these questions are persistent because they are difficult to answer. Both designers, artists, and the institutions that support them are often, in the framework of philosopher Michel de Citeau, strategic thinkers interested in creating structures that steer situations and people towards desired ends. Ultimately, in de Citeau's construction, the strategic creator approaches the task from a position of power. Audiences, if they are to have any power at all, are tactical thinkers, and most gamers that I have met over the years exemplify this position, responding to the stratagems that they inhabit forever trying to work within a given framework and derive a temporary or ongoing sense of meaning and satisfaction with what they are given. How we bring together not just these forces but also these roles is at the heart of the questions today, and at this point I'd like to turn it over to the panel to take on their own individual perspectives within this. Great, thanks, Ted. Um, exactly, Eric, Pedro, and Sheetal, you are actually three artist, game designers, and educators who have been participating in this in this cultural context that Ted just identified. I, I was hoping that each of you could talk about a game project created for an institutional context um, and the expectations around it. What kind of participation of play was expected from the audience? Did they do what was expected? Were there any other ex unexpected outcomes? Eric, if you could start us, that would be great. Uh, sure. Uh, hi, everybody, and I'm so happy to be part of this panel. Um, although I come from the commercial games industry, I've been working for the last few years with an architect making games for an art context, for museums and galleries and festivals, which in some way has returned for me to the art world since I was originally trained as an artist. I thought I would share one of those projects today, a project called Interference, um, which hopefully is appearing on all of your screens right now. Um, Interference is a project that I created with architect Natalie Pozzi, like I said, and it is a room-sized um, installation originally created for La Gaîté Lyrique in Paris last summer, summer 2012. 
as part of an exhibition called uh, Play Along. Interference is a game that uh, is for two players, and it is a small strategy game that you play by moving these little wooden blocks uh, around these hanging steel walls. Now, the steel walls are less than a millimeter thick, so they're extremely thin, and they're transparent, so you can see your partner slash opponent and all of the other players in this space as well. Um, you and your partner, this is actually a photo of, of Natalie, my collaborator and I, in this space. Uh, you and your partner play in a very local area on one wall, but, and you're playing a tiny strategy game, a small strategy game, where you're just trying to have more of your color, either red or white, than your opponent in that local area. Um, the twist to the game is that every turn, you actually take a piece from another pair of players' game. So you walk away from your game, you reach over into someone else's game, take a piece from them, and put it in your game. So the simple strategy game is made more complex by the fact that you're stealing from other players, and meanwhile, they're stealing from you. And so what would otherwise be a fairly straightforward strategy game becomes an exercise in chaos, frustration, then negotiation and metagaming, as you realize that you have to work uh, with and across all of these other games taking place in order to win your game. Um, in terms of Nancy's question, how interference was received and, and, uh, and the kind of experiential context around it, um, interference uh, in many ways uh, really is at the intersection of games and art, in a sense that it is designed for a museum and gallery context, but it's very much a game. And I think that presented a lot of interesting challenges um, for us, uh, for the project. So, for example, um, it's very difficult to have people read a set of rules and learn those rules. And, uh, you know, no one comes to a museum or gallery wanting to, to kind of learn, learn a set of rules and play a game, and uh, especially when there's, you know, other artworks that one can engage with passively or when there are um, uh, video games or things that you might play. In this case, there were other digital games on exhibit. So a lot of it is contending with uh, people's expectations about interactivity in this context. It's, it was also challenging because interference really breaks on some of the rules of games in a sense that you don't normally interfere with another player's game. If you and I are playing chess, we don't expect someone else to reach up behind us, take one of our pieces, and put it into their game. Um, so, because of the fact that we're trying to do unconventional things with games and play and experience, um, that also was, uh, w was interesting for us to contend with. But overall, I think that uh, interference, um, you know, was a beautiful object that, uh, that uh, I can't take credit for, that my architect partner, Natalie Pozzi, designed. And we just wanted it to exist on many levels. So, it's an aesthetic object that's sort of a beautiful, shimmering, uh, sculpture in a space. It's also an interesting object if you decide to interact with it and play a game. And we had many people interacting with it in ways that weren't necessarily prescribed. Whether it was little kids that were kind of moving and sorting the pieces as they wanted to, um, and also for an exhibition coming up in Los Angeles uh, this coming fall, we are going to be working with other game designers who are going to create their own uh, mods of interference. In other words, they're going to create their own set of rules for playing new games using the same hardware and set of pieces. So in a sense, interference, the sculpture becomes the operating system or deck of cards, and they'll be writing new rules for it. I think that's an interesting, unique thing about games, that they're sort of modifiable, uh, perhaps in ways that we don't normally think about art. Um, and uh, I think that's, uh, that's a good little overview of interference. Maybe we'll come back to it. Um, well, I think it's um, uh, my turn after Eric. Thanks so much. Um, what I'm going to uh, share with you now, it's uh, a space where there's uh, different games. Uh, the, the, the exhibition goes by the name of Melodrama and other games. And it's basically a set of posters that I actually have some here right now. That, for instance, 
uh, they come as, as posters that you can take in exchange for playing a game. This one is called Mirroring. And uh, as you probably can see, there's like a set of uh, instructions which are mirrored, like creating a calligraphic, uh, almost Rorschach uh, test shape. But that's only the score or the instruction for a very simple game that I will try to play with you. If you uh, play with me, let's say that you hold a hand. Will everyone hold a hand? Okay, let's see, because uh, let's, let's, let's just, like, you're going to follow what I do. The, the, when, when you're playing this game, you have a partner in front of you, and, you know, like, uh, if, you, if you hold your head and you uh, knock your head ag against the, the edge of the screen, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, we are now pressing, like, disappearing from the screen, and now, let's say that we are, like, turning around. And then we, someone else takes the lead. Let's say, Nancy, why don't you take the lead now and we imitate you? Do Just do anything. Well, that's, that's very good. I think that you get the idea. This is just like a kind of a, a spontaneous activity that happens when you have a very simple instruction that technically doesn't need much more than the idea. And what I was interested in was in doing these uh, very simple games that uh, perhaps you learn in the in the space, but then you incorporate and you can reactivate any time that you are perhaps sharing uh, some time in a waiting room, and instead of each person going into his mobile phone, you get you have a little thing to play, Be because that's what the what games used to were invented for, uh, just to kill time uh, a little bit, but. The idea of, I, I may show you uh, now some pictures of how does this space looks when, uh, is, uh, when, when they are uh, in the space. For instance, I, I just want to make sure that I am, that is working. Uh, yes. Okay. Let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is, for instance, the space. The posters cannot be sold uh, uh, and cannot be bought, but you can, and you cannot take them um, for free. You have to somehow play a game in order to get them as a gift. And they also work as a wallpaper to define the playhouse or the play space. And uh, some are board games, for instance, uh, this one is called Melodrama, that is a kind of a, a, a iteration of uh, snakes and ladders, but with the ups and downs of a romantic relationship. Uh, this one is called Boom, which, where, which is a game where you have a balloon that... Oh, okay. Pedro, I'm so sorry, we can't actually see your screen right now. Sorry, we can't sorry. see the images. It's Thanks okay. for letting me know. Uh, no problem. So I'm start. Okay, I'm gonna stop screen share and I'm gonna. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now I chose this one. How about there? Okay. So in this one, you have uh, boom is a balloon that you have to uh, pop by sheer pressure between two bodies. Or there are others that are uh, like just old parlor games that you like this one where you blow a feather uh, in a sheet and or this one that is called pillow fight and you're suddenly uh, you suddenly find yourself in a very physical activity with total strangers 
letting out all these hilarious uh, uh, expressions of of joy and uh, and 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 madness. Uh, or, for instance, this one, which is called El Pelele. This is an old uh, Spanish uh, game. There's a famous painting by Goya that perhaps you remember. It's basically a dummy that is made out of uh, second-hand clothes and that you toss in the air uh, with a blanket. And it's just very silly and, 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 and uh, playing uh, like game to play. So these props are available in the space. And what you do is that you take the props, play a game, and in exchange you get the poster. And uh, what I was interested in is in somehow two things. One is uh, group dynamics that are created between strangers that are you know like a, that that get together for five minutes to 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 play the game because you need partners. So if you come alone and you're missing one person, you ask a stranger. And I'm interested in, cre in creating those encounters. And the second is also uh, sourcing out many of these ideas from the universe of street games that have disappeared from our world because now first was the arrival of the car and then the street ceased to, see, see, to be a social space and became uh, owned by the car. Then it was television, and finally computers and mobile devices uh, have become uh, so omnipresent that most of our interactions are mediated by uh, 